this is session one. So you should have those new books in front of you, and I, I, I hope you do. And so we're going to be looking at those interactive note takers as we go through. And we came out of Romans 12, 1 and 2. We finished up verse 2 last week. And we were looking at the fact of God's good, acceptable, and perfect will pertaining to the godly thinking, the godly living, and the godly labor. And because Romans 12, 2 was looking forward to doctrines that are yet to come, these three aspects of godliness are the means by which we're going to receive our education. So I think all of that was setting us up for that. In the book of Romans, there is a particular pattern. And what we're going to be doing today, now we are going to get somewhere in this, but I want to make sure that we're all using the same kind of terminology and that when I say something, we all understand what it is I'm talking about. So we're going to establish some of that in the lesson today. In the book of Romans, there's a particular pattern or form in which the doctrine gets presented to us. This will be old hat to you, but I just need to make sure that we all understand. Not everybody's been around for all those other times that we've gone through the education. This pattern consists of three separate parts, and it is identical to the three aspects of godliness. And so in, in the book of Romans, this is the way the doctrine gets presented to us. The first part of the doctrine that, it, 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 that is designed for us to encounter is the godly thinking. Now, again, we, we came right out of verse 2, and we're picking this back up now. And so I don't need to say a lot about that. And by the way, in this first form of doctrine, I'm just going to put it up on the board. In Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, that is the first form of doctrine. And what we have is the godly thinking aspect. And, and as you see on the PowerPoint... Verse 3 is the godly thinking. The second part of the pattern is found in verses 4 and 5, and that is the godly living. That is the order that we're going to encounter it in this form of doctrine, and that's the order we'll encounter it all the way through the book of Romans. And that, that is to say that this is learning to do the, the things that we do God's way, concerns our conduct and behavior. I'm going to make a very important point right here. It's in your notes. But if you want to jot it somewhere in your note taker, you can. But look, we should be looking for ways in our everyday lives to live out of that new thinking. Let me say it a different way. We should be consciously making an effort to find ways to take that new thinking and have it result in a conduct in our everyday life. And that's what the renewing of our mind is all about. That's what it's meant to produce in us. The next one is the third component of the form of doctrine, and that is, of course, the godly labor, and that is verses 6 through 8. And at, at, now, at first glance, it may appear like, I'm so used to looking up at that PowerPoint, I turned around to do it. Uh, at first glance, it may appear that the godly living and the godly labor are the same thing because they both have to do with our conduct. But there is a difference between them. The godly living aspect just has to do with putting that new thinking to work in all kinds of ways in our life. Once we get those two down, once we, you get that godly thinking, the thinking and the living once you get those two down, then the scripture is going to come along and it's going to give you a specific way in which you can actually labor with your father in, in an operation. So let me do it that way. In an operation that he wants to accomplish right now in this dispensation of Gentile grace. You're going to be able to put this to work in lots of ways, but they're not... They're just, they're, that's just the godly living. But when God says, okay, now there's something specific I'm wanting to do, now that is going to concern the godly labor. So you're really taking these first two, and this is where you're putting them to work. As someone pointed out last week, in a sense, 
when we labor with God right here and now, it's sort of like the practice field for when we get up into the creature, into the heavenly places. But I want to just say, though, that, that does not mean... I, I'm a little bit fearful of us to think about it that way, even though I've said it that way dozens of times. Because I don't want you to feel like the labor that you're doing here and now is not important or not necessary. It is critical in nature. Yes, you are learning how to put your sonship skills uh, into use, but you understand that there are some things that just absolutely must take place and the way God is going to accomplish that is through the members of his body, through godliness being at work. So I just want to say what God is doing right now in this dispensation of Gentile grace is dependent upon us, the members of his body. And you're going to see just how important that is. Here's the last thing to fill in on that note taker. That is, we're identifying this as the form of doctrine and that first form is Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. So just to say, so when I talk about a form of doctrine, I'm talking about that whole pattern right there. And these, these are going to be presented to you over and over again in the book of Romans. And, and the ones that come after this are going to be built on this one. They're actually going to stem from this one. They're going to be presented in, in the same way and in the same order. And so because of what we learned in Romans 12, 2, we should, at the end, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, we should have been anticipating this kind of pattern to be presented to us. And so when Paul writes that we're going to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, and we discovered what that renewing was about. It was not reminding us, but it was actually now changing the way we think about something when he's going to renew our mind, you have to understand that, uh, and, and that's what these doctrines are designed to do, we all come to the education with natural human reasoning. That's all we've got. And when you look at that scale or that balance there, then what God wants to do is he wants to displace the natural human reasoning and replace it with this, with godly thinking. And to God, I know that scale looks odd, doesn't it? You got, you got five people on the other side, they're holding a weight, but yet the guy holding the word has the most weight, and that's in the view of God. And I just want to kind of paint that picture in your mind a little bit to say that what God's looking for is not what the world normally thinks. What he's looking for is what every form of doctrine produces in us mentally. And so that doctrinal instruction is meant to conform us in our everyday living uh, to think like Christ and to live like him. And, and, and look, here's the key. This is why this is so important. Because the difference in the thinking is the motive. Why is it we're doing what we're doing? There are plenty of people in the world that do good things, sacrificial things, noble things. But that, that all piles up over there into that natural human reasoning side. Now, what God wants is he wants your motive for what you think and your motive for what you do to come from him. And how do we get it from him? We go to bed at night, and he just kind of puts it in our head, and we wake up with it the next morning. How do we get that? Do your... Do your the word patient. Uh, just by reading and, and going over it and getting it in your head, getting it in your heart, talking to him about it. Okay. So, okay, and so that all that reading and all of that going over is in relation to the Word, right? Yeah. In relation to some form of doctrine. 
So what we're doing is, is we're learning that there is something that our Father can produce in our minds that will result in a conduct and behavior that stems from something He has produced in us, not that we're conjuring up on our own. Do you have something else, Linda, you're just going to add to that? Okay. All right. And so in the beginning, folks, this has to be done on purpose because this is not the way we normally live. Uh, and, and we've already created these habits of doing the things that we do and having the reasons that we do them. It, don't try to think this too far ahead into areas that you're just not familiar with. Just understand that God is going to give you the motive. He's going to give you the reason for doing it. And by the way, it's going to be the same one he has. Cliff? I have a question, and I think we've been over this once before, but I never got it real quick. Mind. We're talking about God's righteousness versus man's righteousness, which at times could be identical. In other words, you see a... They'll look that way. It, it would look that way. Yeah. So if, how do you know which it is? I mean, uh, if, 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 you know, if you help a stranger... Well, I would have probably help a stranger anyway. But how do I make it God's righteousness that helps that stranger? Okay, that's a good question. So how do you know the difference? Right. Okay, so um, that um, you're going to know that because in the beginning, in the beginning, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the easiest way to illustrate this. We're going to be in Romans 12, 3, and we're going to be talking about uh, generating the godly version of selflessness in us. What is going to happen is you are on purpose. You're, you're, you're going to be looking. Hmm, gosh, I'm just trying. I'm trying not to get so far ahead that this becomes weird. Um, you would stop. You would see somebody broke down the side of the road. You would stop anyway and do that. At this point in the education, that's all you have to operate out of. Just human goodness nothing wrong with that it's not evil but it's not good enough for us to be godly okay because what you'll do is you'll see that and you're maybe in the beginning your knee-jerk reaction will be oh you know what I should pull over and give them a hand but once you begin to learn a doctrine that can apply to that situation then you need to stop and think, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can do the same thing, but let me do it because now my father has taught me something. And let's just say in, in Romans 12, 3 through 8, or 3 through 5, or Romans 12, 3. I'm just saying, you're going to have to stop and do that on purpose in the beginning. You're changing the reason for what you're doing. And, and, and why do you have to do that on purpose? Because it's not, your na it's not the natural way you were taught to think. You'll, and so in the beginning you'll know what it is because you're having to stop and do that. But it, when you keep doing it and keep doing it, eventually the old motives, the natural human motives, begin to diminish and now you really are living out of the doctrine. It becomes the default position for you. But you just have to keep doing it. That's the important key. If you don't, if you don't practice it, you won't ever get that skill down. And we can know about it, but you have to actually do it. So in the beginning, it'll be easy to identify. You'll have to stop. So let me just create a scenario, okay? So you're driving down the road, you and Rachel, and you look over and you see a, a guy and his, his, he's got a flat and he's, you know, he, he's searching through his trunk and you go, boy, I hate to see somebody on the side of the road that's got a flat like that, you know, why, why don't I just pull over there and help him? And maybe Rachel then says to you, how about we do that because of, and now she talks about some doctrine that we've studied and learned and you then say, hey, mind your bit. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Got confused. 
then you say, you know what, that's right. Let's do this for the reason our Heavenly Father would do this. It's just a conscious decision to do that. But the more you do it, the more you do it, the more accustomed you are to thinking that way. And you know what happens then? The scripture becomes the automatic motive. It's, it's the thing that's driving you. And you, just, and you just have to do it. Does that make sense? So in the beginning, you'll know. It's not like I'm doing it. Do I, it's not like I'm really doing it for a godly reason, but I don't know it. You will always know it. When you're saying, I don't, I don't know why I'm doing this, then you're back in natural human reasoning. Because to do it out of the doctrine that you've learned is going to take an overt effort on your part in the beginning. Only after you've done that, I don't want to put a time on it because I don't know where the number is for everybody. But let's just suppose, after you've done this doctrine, let's suppose you found all kinds of ways to utilize it in your life. In six months, you may then have a conversation with Rachel where you go, you know what? I find that every time I'm getting ready to do something like this, my mind immediately goes back to, you know, Romans 12, 3. I just keep thinking about that. After a while, you, you, you know what I'm saying? And so it gets itself established in you. That's what you were talking about a while ago, Linda, when you were saying we're reading it, we're thinking about it, you know, we're trying to get that thing established. But, but where do you go from there? You're aware of it. You're thinking about it. Maybe you're even praying about it. And you're kind of contemplating that all the time. But you have to take that one more step. What is that one more step? Yeah, you have, to, you have to do it now with that kind of thinking in mind. That's what your father's waiting for, to see godliness on display. That's a really great question. I hope that that helped you. This is where you go, oh, yeah, that was great, Mike. Okay, <laughs> okay well, that's fair. That's fair. But look, you will, look if, if you are confused about why you're doing it, then you're probably doing it from the old reasons. Because in the beginning, to do it right, you're going to have to do it on purpose. You're going to have to connect it to a doctrine. Now here's, let me just cover this part. Let's suppose you're driving down the road. We've covered Romans 12, 3 through 8, the first form of doctrine. Is that the only form of doctrine we're going to cover in Romans? No. But let's suppose you're driving down the road and you go, there's a guy broke down on the side of the road. I don't know how to apply Romans 12, 3 to that. Okay. Fair enough. What should you do? Drive on past because you can't think of a doctrine? No. You can still help the guy, right? Because you've got to get to the place where you know a doctrine that is applicable. You going to say something here, Richard? Yes, I was. I was going to say a very good point. Of course, just because he's broke down and his hood's up doesn't mean he doesn't have his pistol ready to hijack your vehicle because <laughs> it's running. <laughs> so you can approach this in a godly manner, but beware of the people who aren't <laughs> thinking godly. Okay, and then there's that. Okay. So, uh, what your answer should have been, Cliff, was we'll circle back to that one. Okay, the time okay well, all right. So, there we are. So, now you understand, you'll have to, you'll know this in, in the beginning because you'll have to do this on purpose. And if you don't know a doctrine yet, here's what you know eventually you will. Is it possible that Romans 12, 3 through 8 does contain a doctrine you could apply to that situation, but you're just not skillful with it enough yet to get there? Sure, that's possible. Or it could be you're waiting on a whole other doctrine out there that you just haven't encountered yet. But we will as we move through the education. So God's not... Ma okay, Linda. I was just going to say... It's kind of like going back to rightly dividing. When we first, first very, you know, came a hold of that, and we're all kind of looking at each other like, what, huh? You know, 
and and we thought oh man this is this is something spectacular and but it's like well we don't know how to do it we don't know you know well then later on as you're learning and you're going through things well now right rightly dividing is just kind of like oh well yeah we knew we knew that you know we've known that forever which we really haven't but it's the same thing of what we're going to start now is when we look back and saw how our, our thinking changed about rightly dividing you know and it was in every aspect of everything we did whether it was praying for rain or you right. know, for the wind to stop or you know whatever uh, all that kind of stuff that we don't knew, do now but looking back that's what we used to do right but we had to stop on purpose and go oh no wait yeah I and you remember how difficult that process was let me let me reveal something about my own life when I was coming to terms with the fact that God was not intervening in the physical circumstances and changing things, you know, we make that long drive to Glen Rose on Tuesdays. And so I thought, okay, so God is not watching over us. He is not keeping, you know, if, if the car is going to stay on the road, I'm going to have to keep it on the road with the steering wheel. And, and, and he's not keeping someone else from going to sleep and coming across the median. So I just have to be aware. So you know what I did? Now see, but it was a process. So you know what? I was praying for a while. God, please help me just stay awake so I can be aware of what's going. You know, all I really did was I just changed it from him manipulating all of that to now him just manipulating me. Uh, but but you know what? That kind of came in stages. You, you, you see what I'm saying? That's the way, and that's what you're talking about, isn't it? So this is going to come that way. And so eventually when you understand it, did you ever catch yourself and pray for something that you stopped and you went, oh, wait, okay, that's not right. That's not right. This is exactly the way this is going to work. That's a really good point, Linda. Okay. So So now you have... This natural human reasoning, we're going to replace that with godly thinking. And so now what I'd like to, and by the way, when we talk about godliness, be, I mean, when we talk about the doctrine being the motivation for doing what we're doing, that the scripture is now the reason for doing this. When I talk about being godly, I'm afraid there's someone that's going to be listening to these recordings later down the trail and they don't understand what I'm talking about when I say godly. Because these three aspects right here, those are the issues of being godly. People confuse good behavior with godly behavior. And that means now they're lumping all that natural human goodness in that. That is not the way God is looking at that. And so I just want to say... Being godly doesn't mean you're, you have this emotional love for God or you go to church all the time or any of that stuff. It means those three aspects are at work in your life. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about being godly. And I'm not talking about copying Jesus in his ministry to Israel. I'm talking about godliness as it is written in Paul's epistles. Now let's talk about the first sonship skill of wisdom. Because we know something about the format of our education. And we went back over years ago, back in all the stuff that we did previous, we went back over and we saw a format that was written in the book of Proverbs that applied to Israel in their program. And that they were going to be skilled in wisdom, justice, judgment, and I know this is old school for you, and equity. And then when you get to Paul's epistles, I, look, just because you saw that in Proverbs, that did not tell me that that's exactly the way it was going to be in Paul's epistles. But when you get into the book of Romans, now you do discover that that is exactly the order of the forms of doctrine that are given to you. And so this wisdom, that is going to run from Romans chapter 12, verses 3 to 16. What is the first form of doctrine? It's three through eight. So we have other forms of doctrine that are going to come in verses nine to 16. And those are going to complete. 
the initial instruction in godly wisdom. So I want us to look at this just for a minute because when we say the word wisdom, what immediately comes into people's minds is these are little little pithy sage sayings or, or, or some kind of little nuggets of wisdom. And that's what we're looking at when we get there. And that's not what's taking place here in Romans chapter 12 beginning in verse 3. And so what I want to do is I want to kind of break this down so that we begin to think about this. Oh, well, you've got it in a note taker. So there are some mental filters that you're going to have to go through. When you're thinking about doing something, when you're about to make a decision, there are some things that you need to think about in an order. So I'm going to give them to you. Here's the first one that goes through your thinking. Because wisdom, this thing in wisdom, that is really, well, I'm going to put it on the PowerPoint. No need for me to write it. Here it is. So when you look at, did I give you the rest of that yet? I'm sorry. I, I ran off and uh, got, I'm going to blame it on Clifford. So, okay, the godly thinking, and that's Romans 12, 3. So there's the two, there's the two kinds of wisdom, and God wants that wisdom to come uh, from him. That's the wisdom that's being installed. Now, let's talk about this first mental filter. And so, here it is. The first mental filter for making decisions is the features of godly love. You're going to get, you're going to get told about all these core features of godly love and I just put them up there in a general sense right there, these, these features of godly love. But you're going to learn these in order. What we know is that in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, in that first form of doctrine, you're going to be taught the first main or core feature of godly love. Now, see, remember a while ago when I said to you, when we think of wisdom, we think of these little wise sayings and proverbs and things like that. But when God talks about wisdom, he is actually talking about generating in us his version of godly love and charity. You say, well, how is that wisdom? I'm going to show you that. But before I do, let me put it up what the first one is. The first core feature of godly love is selflessness. Now, we haven't read the verse yet for you to see that. I'm just telling you what that is for now. And then we'll look at the verse here in just a minute. But that means what you would do when you got ready to make a decision, those little circles above the, the little guy that's thinking, what am I, I going to do? In other words, right out beside that first circle is, he's going to be thinking, I've got to put these core features of godly love and charity into effect. So what you'll do is you'll test your decision by saying, is it selfless? Then when you get to the second core feature, which you'll also get in godly wisdom, and the third core feature, which you'll get in godly wisdom, you'll be saying to yourself, is it this? Is it this? So you want to make a godly decision. It's not up to a feeling. God's actually going to walk you through a process here. And the first, the first part of the process is being selfless. Now, again, we haven't looked at the verse yet, so we'll get into more detail when we do that. But when I talk about godly love and charity, when we talk about that, listen carefully. I am not talking about an emotion. Do not expect for God to hit you with a magic wand and suddenly you just really like somebody now a whole lot more than you did before. Because God generated this emotional love in you. That's not what this is about. There was a guy named Gary Smalley. He was kind of like a marriage counselor guy. He wrote a book. And the name of the book, many, many years ago. And it was called this, Love is a Decision. When I first saw that title, I thought, how is that? Because I was only thinking about love from the standpoint of an emotion. So now I'm going to try. So if anybody's stuck where I was way back there, let me see if we can overcome this, this hill here. 
there is an emotional type love that we feel for people that we're close to. The person we marry, our kids, our family, people who are really close to us as friends. We may feel an emotional attachment for that. And, and, and you know what? This is, this, is, this is where people fall off the wagon right here. They hear me say that we're going we're gonna to have generated in us the features of godly love and charity and they instantly think of somebody they don't really care too much about and now they think, well, I'm not going to love them. Stop. God's not asking you to get all emotionally fuzzy about somebody that, you know, has been adversarial toward you. He is asking you to make a decision about them that is in line with how he is thinking about them. By the way, he knows all about them. I'm talking like we're, of course, the good guys, and we never do anything, right? I'm talking about those other people. But God knows everything. He not only knows the stuff they've done to you, he knows all of their stuff. He still feels about them in a certain way. By the way, is he happy about it when people misbehave? No. Is it that he just doesn't care? No, that's not it either. What does he want out of them? He wants Christ in them. That's what he wants out of them. And he's not satisfied with anything less than that. But that's the same way it is for us. He wants Christ out of us too. And nothing less than that. I can already tell I'm going to have trouble getting through this lesson in the, in the time allotted. This is, this is uh, but that's okay. I knew when I was trying to predict how far I would get in a lesson, there would be these times where we just wouldn't get it. And so we'll just have to adjust our books accordingly. I tried to guess it, but, hmm, okay. So, but, but I don't want to, but I don't want to run through this and leave us with a misunderstanding in our mind. Don't think of love as some emotional, fuzzy feeling. Think of it as a decision. And that decision is based on some information that we're going to be given in the Scripture. In other words, God is going to tell you something, and He's going to say, for this reason, you need to think about them this way. You need to treat them this way. And honestly... That's how God thinks about us. When we were yet sinners, there wasn't anything lovely or attractive about us. There was nothing so intrinsically good about us that God said, I've just got to find a way. They're just so good. I just just need to redeem them. That's what they deserve. No, no, no. That's not it. You know what he did? Not... Not some emotional, frilly thing on his part, but God made a decision because he saw us for who he created us to be. And so he made a decision to send his son and redeem us and to give us a new identity in Christ. And, and, to, and to justify us and make us righteous and sanctify us and make us holy and then, give, and then give us this word that's designed to work in us to conform us to the image of his son. He made a decision to do all those things because he saw us in a certain way. And if you're going to be godly, remember, this means thinking like your father. That means now you're going to look around at the other folks in this room You're going to look at the folks that are on Zoom and you're going to say, I now have to think about them in a certain way. And it's going to be the way my Heavenly Father looks at them because I guarantee you the natural human human reasoning is not going to do that. So let's, if we mean business, then let's allow God to transform us into the sons and daughters that he designed for us to be when he did this in the first place so now let me go to your note taker and let's talk about this process because here's what godly wisdom is look, look the, 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 it is properly responding to the doctrine godly wisdom you're going to be shown a, a form of doctrine 
And godly wisdom is going to be us properly responding to that form of doctrine by, and here's the, the first thing in your note taker, by thinking about that the way our Father thinks about it. I know this looks like a repeat, but it's not. It's going to go somewhere different. So this is the process for getting that godly wisdom. The second thing is, we're going to spend time praying or interacting with our Heavenly Father about these doctrines and our actions that come out of those. When we talk about this, by the way, this is not, this is not in your, maybe in your notes, but it's not on your note taker. If you want to fill these in, you can. I, don't, I didn't put them on the PowerPoint, but we talked about the, first, the process is actually now thinking about things the way he does. The next thing was praying, and now I'm going to give you three things that come underneath that because I want to talk to you about that prayer issue. The first thing that you're going to be praying about is your understanding of the doctrine. You're going to talk to your Heavenly Father about what your understanding that doctrine is saying, especially as it applies to the specific situation that you're thinking about. Not just, I'm just dreaming up stuff, but when you're about to make a decision about something, you need to think, you need to think about what that doctrine is telling you to do. Now have a conversation with your Heavenly Father because I would love to hear you say to Him, I'm not doing that. Okay, I was being sarcastic. I would not love to hear you say that. What, what I'm saying is when you're talking to Him, this doctrine now, you understand He's the one that you're dealing with. This is not about making me happy. Who cares if you make me happy? In fact, you probably can't make me happy. I'm just <laughs> unhappy all the time. But, but my point is, when you're talking to your Heavenly Father about the understanding of that doctrine, specifically as it applies to this, this thing that you're considering, and then the second thing you're going to do is explain to Him that in view of the doctrine, what you should do. Because there may be something in your flesh that says, well, here's what I think you ought to do. But there's going to be something in the doctrine that says, no. If you're going to be conformed to the image of God's Son, if you're going to be godly, if the character of Christ is going to be built in you, then now you're no longer going to do the things the flesh loves to do. Now you're going to do what your Heavenly Father says you should do as a justified, sanctified son or daughter who has been given the spirit of adoption, who is going to be laboring with him in the heavenly places. So that's the second area. And here's the third area that you need to do, is that is you need to identify to him your motive. When you decide what it is that you're going to do, then you need to tell him, here's why I'm going to do that. Now, I'm talking to you about it like it's going to be a struggle. It won't always be a struggle. Sometimes, and I hope this will be the way it is most of the time, you'll be thinking, I just want to know what my Heavenly Father expects here. I just want to understand what it is that I should be doing as a godly son or daughter. So here's what you're talking to Him about. Here's why, Now, if you can't talk to Him about your understanding of the doctrine, what does that tell you? If you don't know it well enough to, ha to talk to God about it, and I don't mean like this. Now, dear God, I don't know. Mike talked for like 15 minutes on this. I still don't understand what he was talking about, but you know what it is. That is not good enough. You have to be able to have a conversation with your father about this, and if you don't know it well enough to do that, then you now know you just don't know it well enough, and what should you do then? You're going to come back to this video, you're going to go back to these notes, or you're going, to, you're going to get somebody that you can talk to that can explain it. And you folks have access to me all the time. 
In fact, nobody has more access to me than the people in this room. I take your phone calls at least 50% of the time. And then, based on your understanding of that doctrine, then you need to tell your Heavenly Father what you understand you should do. By the way, if you say this, that's not what I want to do, but I understand what I'm supposed to do. That may not be where you want to be. Huh? But that's where you are. And this, and you know what? Now look, when you engage in this, folks, see this for what it is. This is the process. You know what, Linda? You were kind of describing this earlier. This is the process that gets this ball rolling of not just renewing our mind, but transforming us and, and showing our conduct and behavior to actually be godly. And when you see what it's producing in you, there will be generated in you an enthusiasm to do this again. To do the right thing again. Because now you'll understand this is actually now doing something in you. Look, the world has all kinds of programs to accomplish that. And they work. There are guys who had some kind of an addiction who go through those programs and really work at it, and they overcome those addictions. For some of those guys, those cravings may never completely go away. But for other guys, they put that so far behind them in the rearview mirror, it's not even an issue anymore. But here's what I know. Does anybody... Now, so let's talk about us. What do we have to rely on to get us through? Paul said God's something was sufficient. Yeah, that grace is sufficient. Okay? It's pro process. You said we're probably going to, it's a learning process. We're going to make mistakes, blah, blah, blah. Right? Okay, here's a scenario for you. Say, I'm positive I understand what we're talking about, yet I really don't. And I go into my prayers and I'm telling God all this stuff that's just absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. Is he going to hit me with a bolt of lightning? What the, how's he going to correct me? Okay, just for you. The lightning is not for the rest of us. No, of course not. But, but you, and you know that. Okay, so, but I understand your question. Look, first of all, most of the time when you're doing that kind of stuff, and we don't just do that with God. We do that with people too. We defend um, things that we, we do that we, we, we knew weren't right, but we got defensive about it or something. Most of the time, you know when you're doing that. But let's suppose that you don't, and you're just off base and you're going. What will be the result of that? God is not going to punish you, obviously. But what will, what will happen? Or more accurately, thank you, Barbara, what won't happen? The thing that you're expecting all of this to produce in you won't be happening. In other words, you'll be looking at that, and instead of saying, well, I tried it, it didn't work, what you have to do is go back and examine your own response to the doctrine. And you'll see, it, it, it just won't be working. It'll, it'll be uh, an exercise in futility. And when you sense that, that's the signal. That's the warning light. Uh, you know, that's the check engine light in your inner man that says something's not right. That's the thing that you need to go back. And by, and by the way, God's not trying to hide it. He's not being secretive about it. In other words, God's not saying, you're going to be able to live your whole life and get this completely wrong, and then at the end, I'll just go, gotcha. No, his desire is for you to get it. And so if you have a sincere heart, by the way, 
The next, we're not going to get to it. The ne- we have five seconds. We're, um, in the next note takers, we're actually going to see the prerequisites that have to be in place in order, kind of like what your question is answered here, the prerequisites that have to be in place, I think those are where you go look. If you're off base, it's going to be because of one of those things. So I think I'm going to give you a tool that will allow you to go back and see exactly where you kind of ran off the rails and help get you straightened back up. Because it doesn't do any good just to say, oh, no, you're just wrong, because we would want to know, well, where am I, where am I wrong? And I think I'm going to be able to give you the tools to be able to do that. So I, I, I know that the buzzer is off, but I need to complete this. So let, let's just do this. So I have two more to give you. So our prayer is about our understanding of the doctrine. By the way, what's another way you can understand? You, you'll come to suspect that your understanding may not be exactly accurate. What's another way? Other than just waiting for nothing to happen in your inner man like you were expecting, there, you're going to get, what else? you'll hear something else being said that's going to run contrary to what you were praying about wrongly. We cover a lot of information in these sessions. You'll hear that. What's another way? In talking to other members of the body, you'll hear them talking about it in a different way than you understood it. That's another way that you can kind of catch that. And by the way, don't think about this learning being so individualized that no one will ever know what you're thinking. That's, it's not designed to work that way. We are meant to edify one another. That means there has to be some kind of communication going on. At the very least, Rachel would hear that. And I'm counting on her to go, Oop! in a very kind and loving way. Okay lightning bolts so let's do this next one here's the process here's the next one on your note taker oh i did give this to you on the powerpoint sorry there they are i didn't think i put them on the powerpoint but i did okay here's the third one you have to now act in accordance with what you've been talking to your father about so that's that third one action you can't talk to him about it and understand what the doctrine is directing you to do, and then go do the opposite and expect that this is going to work. So make those actions. That's your decision to do that. No one is controlling you. You say, but, but I just, look, you're no longer under the influence of sin. You've been made dead to sin. That was the whole reason he was checking you out on that back in Romans 12, 1 and 2. There's nothing that can force you to do that. And so here's the last one. The result of this process by which your Heavenly Father's wisdom gets installed in your inner man is the result that you're after. And that result is godliness. And look, you may not look at it that way in the beginning because it doesn't look like it's fleshed out and full. But you understand godliness is not like a light switch. It is a process. It's, you become godly in one area, and then it spreads to other areas. And, and, you, and you get more and more conformed to the image of God's Son. You get more and more godly as a son or daughter. And so the, that result is godliness, and you need to see that from the very beginning. It's like the seed has finally pushed up above the ground, and here's this little plant. Yeah, it's fragile. And it's going to take some taking care of. But one day that thing turns into an oak tree. And now you're rooted and grounded. But you can't just get rooted and grounded from square one. It, it, takes, it takes some time to do that. And you say, well, how long does it take to do that? I don't know. How much work do you want to put in on it? So that's, that's where that is. Let me just see where we are in this. All right, so let me, let me just say two things to you, and then we'll stop right here, and I'm going to kind of make a mark. 
Because as we engage in this process right here, that is how the word begins to effectually work in us. And this is how we get transformed. That, that, and it takes place first in our mind by the renewing of your mind. And so God's wisdom is the foundation for all of our thoughts, what we say, what we do in our everyday lives. Godly selflessness, again, we'll look at that next time, is on, the godly version of selflessness is only generated by the doctrine. It cannot come from any other place. That's what has to be in our mind. And so when you're thinking about something, the very first filter that that decision needs to go, go through is that one right there. When we learn the second one, you're going to see that same little diagram again, but now we're going to get the second filter filled in. Then we learn the next one, we get the third filter filled in. And you're going to see that continue as we go through the various forms of doctrine. Okay, so we're going to stop here.